Welcome to part four of our Galatians Bible study. And in today's episode, things are really going to heat up as we finish out chapter three and work our way into chapter four. And I hope you're enjoying this series so far because I sure am. Now, this ministry is all about defending the biblical roots of Christianity from false teachings like Torahism. So this is an apologetics Bible study, and we're approaching Galatians with an eye for the theological themes that speak to the relationship between the Christian and the law of Moses. So the goal of our ministry is actually modeled here in the book of Galatians, where Paul is defending the gospel of Jesus from false teachers, from Judaizers, who, just like our Hebrew roots friends today, were teaching that followers of Jesus are required to keep the law of Moses. And what's going on in this book is that Paul is mounting a powerful case grounded in the Torah against that teaching. Now, in our last episode, we look at the first half of chapter 3, where Paul was really laboring the point that no one is justified or made right in God's eyes through the law. Just like Abraham, the father of the faith, God considers us righteous based on our faith, not works of the law. And so Paul is writing this letter to the churches in Galatia to correct the false teachers who were trying to convince them that followers of Jesus should be required to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. And Paul says, no, that is a false gospel and here's why. So we're picking up today as he begins to strengthen his case and unpack how both God's promise to Abraham and the law of Moses are related to followers of Jesus today. He's going to tell us when the law was given and why it was given and for how long. And for my Hebrew Roots friends watching this video, man, I pray that you really get a hold of this truth. So let's jump in. So again, we're in the middle of a master class sitting at the feet of the Apostle Paul, who's, who's taught the gospel by Jesus himself, as he told us back in chapter one. So today we're going to pick up in chapter three, verse 15. But to get us back into the groove of the case that Paul's mounting, let's actually start back at verse 13 and then read right into this next passage. So we're going to read through a small chunk of text here, and then we'll go back and unpack it. So chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but, to re but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Okay, so we can see that Paul's now broadening the scope and giving us this wide historical perspective about what's going on. This is so cool. And because I'm a visual guy, and Paul's going to touch on the relationship between a number of things here, let's, move, let's use the chalkboard as we read through this passage. Okay, so let me... Grab some chalk. Okay, so Paul's talking about a promise that God made to Abraham being later fulfilled in Christ, right? So let's set up our timeline here. So here's the historical timeline, okay, that Paul's alluding to. Oops. And at the beginning, we'll put Abraham, okay, and the promise that God made to him, okay? Down here, let's put Jesus, okay? And right about here, let's put the law, okay? Which came, as he just said, as we just read, 430 years after the promise, right? Promise, law, Jesus. So let's, let's dig in a little bit on what, on what Paul's telling us. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And we talked about that last episode. And why did Christ become a curse for us? Verse 14, 
so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So the blessing, we'll call, we'll add blessing here, which is really what the promise is all about, right? And Paul says that it's in Christ. So we'll draw a line connecting these. The promise is in Christ, and it was in Christ so that it might come to the Gentiles. Let's put them here. They have something to do with all this. And then Paul adds in verse 14, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So, so not only does the blessing of Abraham come to the Gentiles through Jesus, but we also receive the promised, let's put it here, Holy Spirit. And how did we receive that? Through faith. We'll add faith here. So, Paul is directly linking God's promise to Abraham with Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit through faith to the Gentiles, right? And then he brings in some legal terms about ratifying and annulling. So what's that all about? Verse 15, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Okay, so Paul is drawing an analogy between man-made covenants and the Abrahamic covenant, the promise that God made to Abraham. So why would Paul bring this up? Well, remember, he's trying to refute the Judaizers in this letter, right? So those false teachers may have been arguing that, that since the law came after Abraham, then, then the law superseded or had priority over the Abrahamic covenant. And Paul's saying, no, God's promise to Abraham of blessing and salvation by faith, and this is what Paul referred to back in verse 8 as the gospel being preached to Abraham. No, Paul's saying that was a binding promise from Yahweh, and not even the law could change that. And then he clarifies the nature of that promise. Verse 16, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Okay, so he is strengthening this link between the promise to Abraham and the coming of Christ. Now the promise was made to Abraham and it was directly and explicitly about Jesus who was the offspring, let's put that here, of Abraham. Okay, some translations would say seed here, the seed of Abraham, because the verse Paul's quoting from the Torah, where God originally made this promise to Abraham, uses the Hebrew word for seed, zarah, and it means descendants or offspring. And what's amazing, and Paul's going to tie all this together in a minute when we get into chapter 4, is that this idea of offspring or seed actually harkens back to the first direct reference to Jesus in the Bible, long before Abraham. Put it back here. Didn't leave enough room. Genesis 3, back here. After Adam and Eve ate the forbidden food and brought sin into the world, God made a promise then as well. Genesis 3.15. This, this verse is referred to by, the, by theologians as the Proto-Evangelium, which just means the first gospel. So, so God's talking to the serpent and he says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So Jesus, as the offspring of Eve, right? The offspring of Eve would defeat the enemy, but he would suffer in the process. So God's promises about the offspring actually go all the way back to the beginning of the human story. And now in the coming verses, Paul's going to teach us about the relationship between God's promise oops, and the law, or we could say between God's grace and the law. Matter of fact, let's write grace here. Now, Paul doesn't use the word grace in this passage, of course, but the promise that God made to Abraham about being justified by faith and, and having all the blessings of salvation that we inherit through faith in Christ, which is, which is what he's about to show us here, that promise was given by God through his grace. We didn't do anything to earn it, right? It was a gift to Abraham and by extension to everyone today who places their faith in Jesus. So, picking up at verse 17, Paul begins to elaborate on this point. This is what I mean. 
The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. So the law of Moses given here did not make God's earlier promise to Abraham null and void, right? And then he adds, verse 18, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Okay, so now Paul's bringing in this idea of inheritance. We'll put that here too. Oops, in, of inheriting the blessings that God promised to Abraham, right? And that inheritance is going to come through God's promise, through his grace, not through the law, right? So Paul's laying out the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant, and he's showing how it's connected to Jesus and the Gentiles and to the Holy Spirit and faith. And it has nothing to do with the law. Now, at this point, Paul knows what his reader's next question is going to be. So he asks and answers it for us. Verse 19, why then the law? So if the blessing was going to come directly through God's promise to Abraham all along, why was the law even given? And here's the answer. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Okay, now I don't know if you caught this, but there are three huge implications in that last sentence. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the, to whom the promise had been made. So let's take a look at this. Now first, it says that the law of Moses was added, which means, which means God had established some sort of a law or let's put principles that predate... Sinai, right? Actually, let's write Sinai here. And the law of Moses, right? So the law of Moses was added to this pre-existing set of principles as an additional element, right? It was added to what already existed. So the law of Moses wasn't the establishing of God's morality. Yahweh's laws about right and wrong and loving God and loving people are grounded in his unchanging moral perfection. And they've always been true ever since the beginning. So let's, let's put an arrow across the top, okay? And we'll add the infinity symbol because it's eternal and unchanging. We're going to call this the, the, Yah, uh, the law of Yahweh or the principles of Yahweh, right? So the giving of the law of Moses here at Sinai wasn't a new revelation on, on morality. In fact, the moral aspect of this law isn't, isn't unique in any way. God didn't appear to Israel at Sinai to, to deliver a moral code. He gave the law to create a unique nation. Okay, and secondly, here in verse 19, why does Paul say that the law was added? It was added because of transgressions, because of sin. In other words, there were transgressions and sins happening in the world, right? The world was overrun by, let's call it sin here, before the law of Moses was given. And that was one of the reasons that God gave the law at Sinai. As, as Paul later writes in the book of Romans, the law served to, to highlight the moral bankruptcy of the human race. It doesn't make us sinners. Rather, it reveals us to be sinners. And therefore, it points us to our need for a savior. The law points us to Jesus, right? And here's the third major implication that I see here in verse 19. And, it, and, it, and it's something that Paul's going to lean in on in the coming verses. And, and this is an idea. In fact, it's a single word that completely undermines the theology of Torahism, of Hebrew roots. In verse 19, Paul says that the law was added because of transgressions until... Wait... Wasn't the law of Moses given forever? Isn't that what Psalm 119 says over and over again? How can Paul say that the law was added until, that it was added only up to the time that something happened? Well, look at what that something is. It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been given. And who is this offspring? It's Jesus. For the Apostle Paul, everything in the Hebrew Scriptures points to Jesus, right? And that's because that's what Jesus taught about himself. God's promise in the garden pointed to Jesus, right? God's promise to Abraham points to Jesus, right? The law of Moses points to Jesus. 
And that's why Paul says that the law was given until Jesus arrived, right? It ended here. So this one clause here in Galatians 3.19 reveals several mind-blowing truths. Paul tells us that the law of Moses had a beginning, which was at Sinai, that it was added because sin already existed, and that it had an expiration date. It was always intended to end at Christ. Even as Yahweh met with Moses on top of the mountain and gave Israel his law, he knew that it was temporary, that it would end when he would later send his son. So the eternal law of Yahweh that has always existed and always defined right and wrong, and it's true for everyone at all times, that's not the same thing as the law that God gave specifically to Israel. And let's write that. Israel through Moses, okay? The Mosaic law absolutely included these larger moral principles that are always true for everyone, but it also included the requ some requirements that were specific to the nation of Israel, right? That would only apply for a time. And then Paul makes a, makes a curious comment. Now, at the end of verse 19, the law was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Now, this is a difficult passage to interpret, and there are actually a few different schools of thought among biblical scholars on what Paul's getting at here. Now, personally, I think he's saying that the law of Moses was given, you know, through angels by an intermediary, which obviously refers to Moses, who mediated the Sinai Covenant. So, with the law of Moses, you have God giving the law through angels to Moses, who then gave it to Israel, right? So, it involved multiple parties. But God's covenant with Abraham was made directly. No middleman was involved. So why would Paul take the time to, to point this out? Well, I believe he's pointing to the superiority of God's promise to Abraham. And he's saying that a temporary law is not greater than a permanent covenant. But however you interpret his comments about the mediator, Paul then returns to his main point in the next verse. Let's see. Verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. And here Paul's using the phrase, give life, synonymously with righteousness, right? If the law could give life, then righteousness would be by the law. It's really the same concept he's been talking about since chapter 2, verse 16. He's talking about justification being declared righteous in God's eyes. This is about salvation. And here he calls it life, right? And the law of Moses isn't opposed to or in competition with the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, Paul seems to be implying that God could have chosen to, to justify us or give us life through human observance of the law. And if he had, if a law had been given that could do that, then yes, righteousness would be by the law. But that's not what happened. Paul's implying that righteousness can't come through both the law of Moses and the grace of his promise, right? These are mutually exclusive alternatives. And God chose grace. Okay. Verse 22. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So God chose to give us righteousness through faith not through the keeping of the law. I mean, this is the grand theme of Paul's entire argument here. And in verse 22, remember that when Paul says scripture, he's not talking about the Christian Bible, right? Because the New Testament didn't exist when he wrote this, right? In fact, Paul was living the New Testament. He was writing it at that time. So when he says scripture, he's talking about the Hebrew Bible. And in particular, because of the context of this case that he's building, he's talking about the Torah. And he says that rather than giving life, the law of Moses imprisoned everything under sin. Okay, and I think it's important to pause here and point out that Paul's really focusing, on, focusing in on one aspect of the law in this letter to the Galatians. This isn't Paul's complete and comprehensive position on the law of Moses. We know from his other letters that Paul considered all scripture, including the Torah, to be God-breathed and useful for training in righteousness. And in Romans 7, he calls the law holy and righteous and good. 
So, so don't read this passage as Paul saying that the law of Moses is this entirely horrible thing that, that can now be thrown away like an old pair of sneakers. He's not saying that because the law of Moses was given by God. But here in Galatians, remember, Paul's trying to make a very specific point. He's opposing the false teachers because of their misapplication of the Mosaic law on followers of Jesus. And in doing so, he's rightly pointing out the dark and difficult yet very true aspects of the law of Moses. So, so here in verse 22, he says that Scripture imprisoned everything under sin, right? So the, the Greek word there is synkleo, which means to confine or imprison or enclose, right? So, so here, let's put prison here. It's the idea of the law being this, this constraining force, right? And back in chapter 2, when he was describing how, how the Judaizers wanted he and the apostles to, to circumcise Titus, who was a Greek believer, he accused them of trying to bring them into slavery, to which he said, we did not yield in submission even for a moment. So let's put slavery here. It's another term Paul uses for this restrictive aspect of the law. And we see Paul refer to the curse of the law earlier here in chapter 3. Back in 13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Right? As we talked about last time, God, God attached blessings and curses to the law, right? Blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And in Galatians, Paul's pointing out the tough yet very real side of the law of Moses, which did include curses. And this isn't because God is mean or, or vindictive. It's because God is holy. And a holy God requires perfect justice. He won't abide sin, right? He loves us and he wants what's best for us. And sin does unspeakable damage to his people. And we see that in the reason that Paul gives us for the law imprisoning everything under sin. Why does scripture do that? So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. <laughs> and so there's that faith again, right? Those who believe. So God has a larger purpose for giving that law with its, with its restrictions and its constraints. It's the discipline of a loving father. The law was given to point us to our need for a savior. And so that the promise that God made to Abraham, which was fulfilled in Christ, could be given to anyone who places their faith in Jesus. And I believe that's where Paul's coming from when he's pointing out these, these tough aspects of the law, right? This is part of the contrast that he's been drawing out since the end of chapter two between faith in Jesus and the works of the law, right? We looked at that in our last couple episodes. So when he talks about prison and, and slavery and curses, this is how the law looks in light of the incredible freedom that we have in Christ. Let's actually write freedom here. This is a, a contrast, right? Sorry for the writing here. <laughs> As Paul's going to tell us in chapter 5, verse 1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery, right? And he's talking about the law there, too. So in light of the freedom that Jesus purchased for us with his blood, the law of Moses is like a prison, right? In light of Jesus, the law is slavery. It's a curse. Okay, picking up at verse 23. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. There's that constraining language again. So then, the law was our guardian. Okay, so let's actually put that there too, guardian. Because that's a more positive aspect of the law, right? Now, the Greek word here is pedagogos, and it refers to a person in charge of leading and guiding children, right? So the, so the ESV renders it as guardian, but some other translations will say tutor, actually let's put that, or schoolmaster, okay? So he says, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. And there's Paul's grand theme again, that we're justified and made righteous through faith in Jesus, not by the law, but now that faith has come, right? Now that Jesus has arrived, we are no longer under a guardian. We're no longer under the law, 
I'm telling you, if you want to remain a sound Torah-keeping Christian, you can't be too careful of your reading, as Lewis would say, because spending time here in the book of Galatians is going to challenge that theology at every turn. Now that Jesus has come, we're no longer under the law of Moses. This verse couldn't be any more clear, right? Now that Jesus, Jesus has come, we're no longer under a guardian. We're no, under, no longer under the law. Now, this is Paul's message to the false teachers in Galatia, and it's his message to the modern Hebrew roots movement as well. Now, in this passage, Paul uses a curious phrase. He says, now that faith has come, which raises a question. Hasn't he just been telling us that Abraham was considered righteous because of his faith? So hasn't faith always been around? I mean, I mean, hasn't it always been about faith? And yes, Abraham, David, and, and other believers in God in the past were considered righteous based on their faith. But here's the thing. The forgiveness that, that believers received before Jesus actually depended on Christ's atoning death for their sins. Now, that might sound odd, but it's what Scripture says. I mean, Romans 3.25 says that, in his divine forbearance, God had passed over former sins. And Hebrews 9.15 clearly explains this concept. It says, Therefore he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. <laughs> so the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was so powerful, it was so efficacious, that it brought ultimate forgiveness even to those who lived and sinned before he arrived. Like I said, everything in Scripture points to Jesus. And Paul says here in Galatians, now that Jesus has come, we're no longer under the law of Moses, right? Verse 26, for in Christ you were all sons of God through faith. And, and by the way, that's, that's not a gender-specific statement. So some, some translations say, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So if we've placed our faith in Christ, if we've publicly confessed that we are followers of Jesus, then Paul says we have put on Christ. And that phrase refers to a change of clothes. It's the idea of exchanging our garments, our dirty rags, for the righteous robe of Jesus. And God now sees us through the righteousness of His Son. And there's a, there's a cultural subtext going on here as well. Remember, Paul referred to the law as a tutor or, or a pedagogos, which is someone who leads and trains children. And he's actually beginning here to bring in this concept of coming of age, of maturity. And to the Galatians, this idea of changing clothes would have been understood culturally as well. So in first century Roman culture, when a child came of age, he stopped wearing his childhood garments, and instead he put on the robes or the togai of an adult. And as Paul's going to expound on here in a minute, God's people have come of age in Jesus. They've reached the status of adulthood, so to speak, before God, right? And once you've done that, why go back to the childhood of the law? But before we get there, look at how Paul defines the people of God. Verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And there's that concept of, of inheriting again, right? If you are Christ's, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, then God considers you Abraham's offspring, and you get to inherit the blessing that God promised through Abraham, right? Now, the law of Moses was only given to the nation of Israel, right? And they were the physical offspring or descendants of Abraham. This law wasn't given to the Gentile nations. I mean, God didn't command the Egyptians to keep Shabbat. He didn't demand the Babylonians eat a kosher diet or, or that the Hittites circumcise their males at eight days old or, or command the Romans to keep the Torah feasts. No, the law was given to Israel alone. And because of that, the law was unable to satisfy the promise that God made to Abraham that in him, all the families of the world would be blessed. Matter of fact, let's put Jew here. Jew 
and Gentiles, right? All the families. Because the law of Moses only applied to the families of Israel. But the promise would apply to all the families of the earth, right? And the Judaizers knew this quite well. It's why, as we saw in chapter 2, they pressured Peter into separating himself from the Gentiles, even though Peter knew better. And so Paul very directly points out that under Jesus, in, in God's new covenant, all that has changed, right? It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile or a slave or you're free or you're a man or you're a woman. What matters is if you've placed your faith in Jesus. And if you've done that, then you are a son, matter of fact, son or daughter of God. Of, you are Abraham's offspring and an inheritor of the blessings that God promised through him, right? And it's only through faith in Jesus that we're adopted into God's family. And then Paul goes on to unpack this idea of being an heir, of being a son or daughter of God. Chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he's a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So when you're a child, although you're legally considered an heir to the whole estate, in many ways, you're no different than a slave. You still have to obey your guardians. You have no decision-making rights. Your freedom is restricted, right? You don't actually own anything. But there's an until here for the heir, right? There's a future date set by the father, Paul says, when all that will change. Verse 3. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Now, the phrase elementary principles of the world has a, a negative or restrictive connotation here, right? And the more I studied this chapter, I began to wonder if maybe Paul, because, because there were both Jews and Gentiles in the churches in Galatia, maybe Paul chose this phrase intentionally to speak to each of them, right? So the Jewish believer would understand it as a reference to basic religious teachings, right? The, the ABCs of the law of Moses. And as we've seen, Paul's been emphasizing the, the restrictive aspect of the law in light of the freedom of Jesus. So it would make sense that he would say that they were enslaved to the ABCs of the law, right? And yet, the phrase elementary principles of the world could also refer to spiritual powers like, like evil spirits and demonic entities. So the Gentile believers would understand it as a reference to their former way of life of worshiping idols and false gods and all that. And then he goes on, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, what a great turn of phrase, the fullness of time, right? He's saying, when all of the things that God had established had come to pass, right? When the law had fully served its divine purpose, or to use Paul's analogy, on the date that had been set by the Father, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And here's another profound theology lesson encapsulated in a single sentence. Why does Paul specifically mention that Jesus was born of a woman and born under the law? Well, it's because of the mission that Jesus came to fulfill. We talked about how the, how the world was full of sin, which is why Yahweh added the law. And who was doing all that sinning against God? It was human beings, right? And not just Israel, it was the entire human race. And so the debt to God for that sin had to be paid by a human being, by the offspring of Eve, right? He's the offspring of Eve as a human being. Paul elaborates on this concept in Romans 5 as he contrasts Adam with Jesus. He writes, uh, verse 18, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, that was the sin of Adam in the garden, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men, meaning the sacrifice of Jesus. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. And this is why Paul tells us that Jesus was born of a woman. He was a human being, a representative before God of the entire human race. 
And he also tells us that Jesus was born under the law because as the promised Messiah, Jesus was also a representative of the entire nation of Israel who had been unable to keep the law and as a result had broken the Mosaic Covenant. About 600 years before Jesus, let me put it here, call it right there, Jeremiah, this is getting busy, but Jeremiah tells us that while God was a faithful husband, Israel was an unfaithful bride. And where Israel failed to keep the law, Jesus then stepped in and kept the law perfectly and fulfilled it, right? As he said in his Sermon on the Mount, he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Matter of fact, after his resurrection, Jesus explained to his disciples that his, his, res, his mission had been ac accomplished. Check it out. Luke 24, 44. Then he, Jesus, said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. In other words, it all happened before your very eyes. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Doesn't that give you chills? I mean, Jesus fulfilled his mission. We were ransomed, as Peter writes, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus was the perfect sinless sacrifice needed to atone for our sins. The book of Hebrews says that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And therefore, it says, there is no longer any offering for sin. So, when God's people were imprisoned under the law, as Paul put it, they were required to make continual, repeated blood sacrifices to atone for their sin. But Jesus put an end to that, right? And under the law, God's people also had restricted access to Him. So, so in the beginning, in the garden, right, mankind walked in God's presence. But then we, we sinned and we were kicked out of the garden and, and removed from God's presence. And later at Mount Sinai, God began the process of, of restoring our access to Him, right? He established the, the priesthood and the temple, and He said His presence would dwell in the temple among His people. But access to God was still restricted. I mean, under the Mosaic law, out of the entire nation of Israel, only one man, the high priest, was allowed into the most holy place at the center of the temple where, where God's presence dwelled. And even he was only allowed in once a year. The most holy place was separated by a curtain through which only the high priest could pass on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. That's what the Mosaic Law requires, right? And guess what? Jesus put an end to that too. Matthew's Gospel tells us that at the moment Jesus died on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. God himself tore down the curtain that was keeping his people at a distance. So unlike the Israelites under the law, followers of Jesus have the freedom to, as Hebrews 10 says, enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Rather than being cut off from access to God, we can now draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And we can do this because Jesus completed his mission and inaugurated the new covenant. So when the resurrected Jesus tells his disciples in Luke 24, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power on high. This is what Paul is referring to here in Galatians 3, when he says, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Because the death of Jesus was the date set by the Father when his people would come of age and receive their inheritance. 
So look at this stuff over here. The Holy Spirit, faith, Jews and Gentiles, offspring, sons and daughters, right? Inheritance, freedom. What is all this stuff over here? What is that? This is the new covenant. This is the gospel, right? This is the entire point, the goal, the, the intended aim of the law. Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, the Greek word translated end there is telos, which means the, the ultimate object or the aim, the purpose, right? So the purpose of the law of Moses was to point us to Jesus. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And therefore, let's finish out today's passage. And therefore... Uh, oops, Galatians 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. I love that. Abba, Father is Jesus' unique way of addressing God, right? And we get to call the Father the same thing that Jesus does, because through our faith... We're adopted as sons and daughters of the Father. We're no longer enslaved to the law, but rather we're children of the Most High King who have come of age and received our inheritance. Whew. Okay, so we've covered a whole lot of ground here, so this is a good spot to wrap up. But thanks again for tuning in and walking through this amazing book with me. I'll see you on the next one. Shalom.